Uh, good morning, everybody. It's uh, a few minutes after eight now, and to be respectful of everyone's time, uh, I want to go on and get started with the eight o'clock meeting of the Special Committee on Access to the Civil Justice System. Uh, I appreciate the members who have uh, uh, made it here this morning. We have two here um, with us physically, and then I believe we have Chair Lady uh, Rich, who's uh, joining us uh, online, so we we appreciate that. And Representative Collins is with you also. Oh, okay. We got uh, Representative Collins. Didn't see you on there, but we appreciate you uh, being here as well. We have two bills that we're going to discuss today, and uh, it's House Bill 639 and House Bill 687, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to let um, Representative Scoggins, the author of the bill, just uh, get started. Maybe just give us an overview. And uh, Representative Scoggins, you can uh, kind of give us the rundown on, on both bills at, at once or one at a time, whichever uh, you prefer. And then I'll allow you to kind of call your witnesses up as in order as you choose. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and discuss these two bills. Uh, we're dealing with House Bill 639 and House Bill 687. Um, House Bill 639 uh, basically is going to amend Title 51 uh, relating to torts so as to provide transparency with respect to asbestos trust claims and claims made by civil asbestos actions. Uh, to provide for legislative findings, to, to provide for definitions, and to revise the information required on the sworn form, uh, sworn affidavit or information form, excuse me. Uh, 687 is uh, to amend uh, also, it's also in chapter 14 of Title 51 uh, relating to asbestos and silica claims, so as to revise the filing requirements for asbestos claims and silica claims. Um, what I plan to do, I have Mary Margaret Gay, uh, believe it or not, we have another Mary Margaret with us, uh, Mary Margaret Gay, and uh, she is going to uh, uh, talk about these two bills, and I don't care which way she goes, which bill you'd rather do first, but uh, um, I know we've got a caucus meeting coming up, and so I'm not going to read my uh, opening notes, I'm going to pass it out to everybody, so uh uh, I'm going to go right into Mary Margaret and let her start her uh, ex explanation of the two bills. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody hear me? Okay. The good news about having a loud voice is when the time came to wear masks, people can still hear everything you say. So glad to be here this morning. My name is Mary Margaret Gay. I am an attorney um, who has practiced for more than 20 years in asbestos litigation. Um, I'm here today to provide you some background information about these two bills, and I can talk about them together. Um, I'll go through them um, just because they kind of go hand in hand. Um, really to pull together and frame up the issues in asbestos litigation in Georgia. Um, Eric Hawkins is here today. He is a attorney here in Georgia that can talk to you specifically about asbestos litigation in Georgia. Um, although I have a kind of national view of the information, I can talk to you a lot about what's going on around the country. I have looked at the Georgia information from a data analytics standpoint he can tell you on the ground really what's happening in Georgia asbestos litigation. I'll do my best to answer, but I may yield to him on that. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, and I am happy to stop at any point, answer your questions. Um, just tell me to stop and I'll answer whatever you have. Um, so asbestos bankruptcy transparency legislation, which is House Bill 639 and the overnaming legislation which is House Bill 687, are necessary to promote integrity and justice in judicial proceedings in civil asbestos actions in Georgia. They reduce the opportunity for suppression of critical evidence in asbestos actions, enhancing the ability of courts to really oversee those cases as they move through the court system. Um, as shocking as it is, I don't know how many of you are lawyers, um, more than 10,000 companies have been named in asbestos litigation over the past 30 years. And just as a little bit of background, what happened was there were about 100 companies that were called the Big Dusties. They were asbestos insulation manufacturers. 
those companies started going into bankruptcy, a specialized type of bankruptcy called 524G bankruptcy, different than any other type of bankruptcy you'll deal with because it allows you to not only take your current liabilities into bankruptcy, but all future liabilities as well. So liabilities you don't even know about currently, um, you can take into the bankruptcy process. Essentially, it created kind of this parallel road of bankruptcy litigation and tort litigation for a person who's been injured related to asbestos exposure. You can not only go out and sue in the tort system for companies that aren't bankrupt, but you can also file claims in the bankruptcy system to get money for those companies that have gone into bankruptcy. Keep in mind, these were the companies who were the big dusties that were the producers of the asbestos for the most part that probably caused the injury. The other 9,900 companies were more secondary, third tier type companies that are frankly solvent, so therefore they get sued. Um, the average plaintiff, um, there was a case 2014 called the Garlock bankruptcy, happened in North Carolina in federal court where the judge required an enormous amount of information about asbestos litigation, probably the biggest um, just documentation of the litigation to come together. And he looked at it and said, there's fraud in this system in the sense of these people are going out and filing claims in the bankruptcy system and filing claims for the exact same injury in the tort system. And this is problematic. And we need to make sure that there is transparency so that the people in the tort system are given credit and know the information that's going into the bankruptcy system. How do we do that? And legislation has been the answer to that problem. Um, it, we passed legislation in 16 states to address this issue. Um, on average, there's about $25 billion. Before you move too far away sure. from the Garlock case, I just, just for my, and I may have missed it, where, where did that case originate? It was in federal court in North Carolina's bankruptcy court okay. in North Carolina. All right, thank you. And I'm happy to provide you the citation if you need it. Oh, you're good. Thank okay. you. I was just curious. Thank you. Sure. And the judge there issued a huge opinion um, that documented what he found in those cases. Um, probably one of the best historical um, references in asbestos litigation of what is happening. Um, on average, a plaintiff will file about 18 or 20 bankruptcy trust claims. Um, in addition to filing their lawsuits. Um, I think the average I saw the other day that came out, they can get a, a mesothelioma plaintiff, get close to half a million dollars bankruptcy trust without ever filing a case in the tort system. Um, the problem is you've got to have that information when you get into the tort system for your case. Who caused this injury? Where do we get the information? Transparency regarding bankruptcy trust claims is necessary um, to get all of the relevant information in the civil action and the tort system. They're necessary for your case to capture your exposure history, your medical information. Keep in mind, there's a 30 year latency period for a person who's been exposed to asbestos. That means they don't really get sick for the most part years later after their exposure and making sure you have all the information about those exposures over time that come in um, are extremely important. Um, what has evolved from the bankruptcy process is a pattern and trend of overnaming defendants in the litigation. When those initial companies went into bankruptcy, what happened was the search for the ever solvent defendant. Go out and naming companies over and over and over in cases without knowing that that company has a direct relation to the plaintiff who is filing the lawsuit. The uh, invention of the internet makes that a lot easier. You can Google, um, find lots of names of companies. And so what this legislation is asking for is that the plaintiffs provide information at the start of their lawsuit that certifies um, and then supplements the claims that are made in the bankruptcy process, as well as the defendants who they are moving against in the lawsuit, why they have a claim of exposure against that specific defendant, as opposed to this laundry list that gets produced on asbestos complaints. Just to give you an idea of the laundry list, um, there was a complaint, and I can go through general data information about complaints in Georgia, but you're looking at 40 to 50 defendants 
named on asbestos complaints in Georgia. Um, you could imagine just the clerk's office having to deal with the paperwork and administration that comes with docketing every defendant that's named in a lawsuit and preserving our judicial resources, pres preserving resources for companies who shouldn't be in the suit in the first place is extremely important in the state of Georgia, making sure that defendants are properly named in a lawsuit at the time of filing preserves our judicial resources and helps companies know what they really have liability for. There's a huge dismissal rate um, for companies. There are some cases that just get completely dismissed. One or two defendants end up paying or settling the case. The rest spend one, two, sometimes three years in litigation. Just the day-to-day -day transactional cost to get out of the case is enormous. You can imagine you get sued in a lawsuit, you spend every day thinking about it, worrying about it and paying a lawyer to monitor it. Um, if that's all you do, you're still spending very valuable money in a case you shouldn't even be in in the first place. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Um, I think Eric can talk now a little bit more about what's happening okay. in Georgia. I don't see any questions here from uh, members online. So we will um, introduce Eric Hawkins uh, with, uh, and, and let Eric uh, come up and talk a little more about the Georgia specifics. And I know Boyd, they're both here with you. Did you want to go in and say anything? Or? Well, then I was going to do this challenge to say good morning, Boyd Pettit, Georgia Life Public Affairs Group. We represent Greg Sears Office Legislation in Glasgow with this. Oh, it was good to have you. Thank you. <laughs> We're gathering all the information. We're going to circle back for the specifics with you shortly. <laughs> All right, uh, Mr. Hawkins, please introduce yourself and then uh, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, thank you. I'm Eric Hawkins. I'm a lawyer at Hawkins, Parnell and Atlanta, based here in Atlanta. Uh, Hawkins, Parnell and Young, based here in Atlanta. And uh, it's my pleasure to be with, with y'all here today. I've been uh, practicing asbestos litigation in Georgia since 2007. So it's been most of my career here. And we, we deal with most, if not all, of the asbestos cases here in, in Georgia. Um, well, we did. What I want to talk about today is just the practical effect of the uh, legislation on our litigation here. Uh, what we did is we reviewed the public docket of asbestos cases filed in the past five years just to see the effect of overnaming and, and bankruptcy um, trust claims on the legislation. What we found with the overnaming is that, like Mary Margaret said, there are dozens of defendants named in every case. And when you look back through them at the end of the day, about half of these companies are getting dismissed without prejudice. So what that means from a practical effect is that we're having to file answers, we're having to go through discovery, uh, motion practice, all sorts of things that are just adding costs to the companies every day that for companies and defendants that shouldn't be in the case in the first place. Um, and that time, the time is substantial. It's often two to three years of discovery for each of the cases. We found, uh, just as an example, there's uh, uh, one case where we had 49 defendants named in the case and 23 were dismissed. Um, We've had another one filed recently where 50 companies were named and 26 dismissed. So that just shows, I mean, these, these are dismissals filed. E even if they're filed <clears throat> early on in the case, a lot of times with these cases, uh, the depositions happen quickly because these are people that sick and need to get deposed. So um, even if you're in the case early and get out early, you're still incurring those costs with the deposition attendance and, and preparation. Um, in terms of the bankruptcy and, and trust transparency, this bill builds on the 2007 asbestos litigation reform, uh, which passed and went into effect and has had good effect on a lot of the litigation. Uh, but there's, there are some gaps there. Um, you know, one thing that uh, that legislation requires is that claims be, sub that you have to disclose any claims that are actually submitted and also any that you know, think you may be liable. <clears throat> and so that, that comes in, in the form of a, a sworn information statement that comes at the beginning of the case. And so what we found is that while we are getting some information on the claims, there's still gaps in terms of the information that were provided. Um, this statute would then require that they disclose any that are known or, or could be filed. And so we'll close that gap and be able to get that information on our cases. And, you know, it's crucial to the defense of the cases. Um, one, one issue, uh, let me jump back for a second. Is the reason on the delay is that there's a difference in terms of statutes of limitation. So for uh, you know personal injury case in Georgia, you got to file your suit within two years. But a lot of these bankruptcy trusts, they have a statute of limitation that may be three years or longer. So you can delay filing with it. Um, 
And then the information is, is important to apportionment under Georgia law under 51, 12, 33, you know, in Georgia, we can apportion liability to non-parties, but you can't apportion that liability unless you know the information. So once we get the information, that's something that will help with the defense of the cases. Um, so in, in practical, in conclusion, this would be helpful in our practice. It would be uh, good in requiring the disclosures and preventing overnaming and filling in the gaps in the legislation. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Eric, on the um, 49 cases that you mentioned, mm -hmm. file on one case, there's 23 of them. Those 23 small businesses that were included on this had to pay fees for attorney fees. They had to uh, file an answer with the court. So they lost a lot of money when they were not even really entitled to being enlisted with the suit. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So they have, you know, as soon as the suit's filed, they have 30 days to file an answer. And so, you know, it's, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of dollars there. And then the deposition attendance and, and, you know, each company, you know, has different lawyers. So you, each company is incurring those costs. And Mary Margaret explained it kind of this way to me when we first talked about, uh, for instance, this ink pen. And if the suit is against the ink in the pen, um, also named in the suit was the small business that makes the corner on the top, the small business that makes the clip that goes on the pen, the small business that makes the spring inside the pen were all named in the suit, but they had nothing to do with the ink inside the pen. And that's the pretty much the basis of the way you explained it to me. Is that correct? Sure. Yeah. And it goes now, that was kind of your second tier. Now you're moving into your third tier. Right. The people that owned the truck that delivered the pen to the company at yeah. the location or just goes the people on that on. made the box that had the pen in it um, all get brought into the litigation until such time that they can determine um, dismissal. But it, in addition to the cost for the small business, there's cost for your courts and your courthouses and just the day-to-day -day of dealing with those 23 defendants that had to get dismissed. Do you think the overnaming, if uh, we solved that here, would uh, expedite the cases? Would they move along faster, do you think? I can tell you from my experience in other places that it has definitely not stalled the litigation or delayed the litigation in any way. Um, you know, whether it'll make it move faster, that's hard to ever right. predict in any litigation. But I can only imagine that a very sick plaintiff sitting in a room answering questions from five to 10 defendants who actually caused the injury will go much faster than sitting in a room with 57 different lawyers right. asking questions, half of whom don't belong there. Right. Okay. I just had a quick question and we'll get to Representative Montan. I, I see on for House Bill 639, we do have, we have seen it pass in about 16 states. Looking over at House Bill 687, the map shows four states. Um, is it pending in, in others? I don't know of any other states where it's currently pending um, that, is, that, I, that I'm aware of. Okay. Thank you. All right. Representative Montan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to bring up a, uh, kind of an idea. I, I'm not an attorney uh, on this committee, but uh, I'm a small business owner. And I'm just going to ask, it's fairly common. I've had others bring, we, we had car dealerships bring similar ideas and legislation to us about being uh, brought into litigation that's uh, based on the manufacturer. So they received a vehicle that they didn't manufacture, they didn't outfit, they had nothing to do with say braking system or ignition system but this is not the only industry have they asbestos is not one of the only industries that deals with this right i mean almost all you know companies deal with this kind of lawsuits as these you know plaintiffs are going through and trying to figure out uh, who is ultimately responsible for the case is that is that i'm just saying this is not uh unique to asbestos I agree. I, I think there's probably uh, lots of litigation out there. I do think the difference between asbestos is it is a historical repetitive litigation. So what happens is these trends happen and people pick up on them. So in a situation where somebody legitimately does not know when they file the lawsuit about what the car dealership where they bought from and had information, that's a much different situation than someone going out 
and naming every potential car brake manufacturer in the mm -hmm. country ever, sure. only to find out that that company didn't even exist in the state they lived in at the time. Uh, it's just a little different scenario just because of the historical, um, you know, and you may speak to that. You probably mm. had companies that were nowhere near and have any causal connection in any way, even on someone's wildest dreams. Um, but that's not uncommon. I, I would say that's not uncommon for these plaintiffs to sue in almost any industry folks that were either direct or indirectly related to the, to the claim. Well, most of these aren't even indirectly that. Mm -hmm. I agree that mm -hmm. there's a lot of indirect. This is literally a scenario where someone Googles every company that has manufactured brakes from this year to this year over an 80 year period and drops every company in a lawsuit only to find out that ABC Auto Store was the only auto store in their small town during the time. Now, whether ABC should be in or not, I don't know. But these 300 others or these 50 others or 30 others should have never even been there. They never sold in the state of Georgia. They never operated in the state of Georgia, those kinds of scenarios. So it takes indirect to a whole new level um, simply because of the sophistication of the litigation over the years. Now, I'm not an attorney, and I just, but isn't that what discovery is for? Discovery is if you have a valid reason to believe that. Um, you have a claim against that defendant, and that's just not what we're seeing here. That's I'm a question. Thank you. I've got one more question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Thank you, Representative Montan, Representative Scoggins. Um, Mary Margaret, did uh, when when this passed in other states, you mentioned it's in 16 states. Did the chambers get involved about uh, with this kind of litigation simply because it helps small businesses? Um, I can't. I can't speak to chamber involvement in those because I don't have firsthand knowledge of that. I can tell you that um, small businesses are very interested in anything they can do. Asbestos litigation costs a whole lot of money for these businesses. And as we can see, it's put hundreds of businesses in bankruptcy. These businesses are going into bankruptcy because of asbestos litigation, which is different than any other type of litigation. So small businesses are interested in not being named in Georgia frankly, anywhere else in the country. Because when it happens one place, it spreads like wildfire. Your name gets on a complaint and it's repeated over and over. Um, so they're very interested in making sure that um, they can do all they can not to be named where they shouldn't be. Okay. Thank you for that. We have a question from uh, Representative Holcomb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, mostly, I, I just need to really get educated in a hurry on this. Um, I am an attorney, but I've never handled any asbestos type issues. I've read through everything that you've provided. Um, and uh, let me just start from the beginning. The court case that you mentioned, um, since lines 35 and 36 um, kind of make a finding on that, I would like the citation and I'd like to read it. And I'd also like to know if there's any pending appellate action on that. In other words, if we're going to have a final statement here, it needs to be 100% accurate. Yeah, sure. The Garlock bankruptcy um, was an estimation proceeding in that bankruptcy. The bankruptcy is now up and running and paying claimants based on that estimation process. It was a little bit different than um, litigation per se. It was a process where the judge in the case looked at the assets and liabilities of the company to determine how much a plaintiff should be entitled to get paid for the future asbestos liabilities. And just, um, and I said this, I'm sorry, I don't know if you were here when I said it, but the 524G process is a uh, very unique. It is the only bankruptcy process that allows you to include future liabilities. So liabilities you do not even know about at the time you file your bankruptcy get included. And so as part of that process, the judge does an estimation where they look back historically at your payments, at your claims, at your um, verdicts, and says, going forward, this much money has to be placed in trust for future asbestos liabilities, and this is how much plaintiffs should be paid. And what happened in that process was the judge looked at all of the prior verdicts, settlements, lots of other information, and said, 
something's going on here that's problematic for me. And what I'm seeing is exactly what Eric talked about, people withholding filing claims until after the lawsuit was finished so they could say, I haven't gotten any money. I haven't been paid for my injury. The minute the case is done, it ended up that the person went and got money and filed um, for their case. So the Garlock case, I can give you, uh, it, is, it was in North Carolina. And I think I deleted it off here. Can I send that to you? Yeah, please, or to the committee. Yeah. Sure, I'll be happy to send it. It's, so when you, I want to make sure that I understand procedurally what you just said. Sure. Um, I think what I heard you say is that the civil litigation exhausted and then they go file a claim to the trust. Is That's that right? right? Okay. Yes. So it's a very parallel highway system where the tort claim and the bankruptcy process run side by side. And a lot of times the tort case ends before the bankruptcy lanes ever run out. Um, we have bankruptcies that are just starting to open new companies. I think um, several companies this year have already filed for asbestos related bankruptcy, a number file every year. I have, um, I've deposed plaintiffs before that said, I've been getting checks in the mail for 20 years. Um, those checks just continue to come in and that needs to be disclosed in the tort case. And frankly, there are lawyers around the country that do it and do it very well. We have cases that come in and they say, here's my lawsuit. And here are all the tort, all the trust claims that have been filed for this plaintiff that we are aware of. All the information is produced um, at the time of filing. Okay, I understand. Uh, because in the trust claims, they're making certain sworn statements and representations as to what they believe causation is. Correct. Correct. Yes, they're talking about where they worked, where they were, who they were with, um, you know, information about their exposure, the products, the frequency, regularity, proximity of being working with those products. Okay. And is the issue that I presume that this is being asked for in discovery, but it's just not being provided. Is that the issue or? There are two sides to it. One is, and Eric can speak directly to a Georgia case, but it is being asked for in discovery. It's not being provided. Or the answer is, no, we have no bankruptcy trust claims, which is what the judge, the federal bankruptcy judge in Garlock found. No, we don't have any claims. And then the minute that case is finalized, they go out and file their claims because the statute of limitations is different. I got you. So is that they're telling the truth. Case? It's just then they're, in your opinion, gaming the system by then filing right after. Yeah, it's definitely, it's called the reference has been double dipping or two bites at the apple. Um, okay. Yes, and that is just something that, although defense lawyers for a long time thought was happening until the federal bankruptcy judge, I think it was a 284 page opinion in Garlock issued an opinion and said, I, am, I find this and here's the history of it. And he went into great detail about what he saw and how he found um, that information in the cases, cases where people would take verdicts. I mean, um, a case, Garlock settled for $450,000. A sailor denied he ever saw anyone installing or removing pipe insulation on a ship. After the plaintiff settled with Garlock, however, the plaintiff's lawyers filed 11 trust claims on his behalf, seven of which, based on declarations, the plaintiff, quote, personally removed and replaced insulation, identified by name the insulation products to which he was exposed. I hear you, but at the same token, like... Are there other remedies for people not being accurate and truthful? If that's what is happening here, I, I mean, the, the lawyers have an obligation to not well, submit my case is statements over at that, that are point. false. So, sorry, say again? My case is over at that point as a defense lawyer. So there's no way that I ever know about it. Um, and then, yes, you're right. The rules of ethics as a lawyer, you um, would require someone to do what is appropriate for their case. Um, maybe employed. If it's the same counsel. All right. Um, and that's one other interesting point you bring up. So in asbestos litigation, most people have tort counsel and bankruptcy counsel, um, neither of which share with the other what's going on. So as a lawyer, I've had lawyers stand up and swear under oath, you know, swear under oath, but swear um, to the court that their client, their client has never made a bankruptcy claim, only to find out they had a prior lawyer who filed all their bankruptcy claims or they have another lawyer that's handling their bankruptcy. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, I have more questions if that's okay. I don't know if we're pressed for time. Okay. Um, 
Can you give me, I mean, I'm generally aware of the asbestos issue in terms of like contracting and, you know, the walls and insulation and all that kind of stuff. What's the scope of the range of businesses in which this is being raised as an issue? Is it everything under the sun? Is it mostly focused in construction? Like, can you give us some characterization of where um, this is happening? And then while you're thinking about that, I'm also interested is, is the trend line generally going down? In other words, was the rush of asbestos led um, litigation 20, 30 years ago? Or is it still really active now? Like, where are we on the trend line? Are we towards the end of this? Or is there still a lot? So in, in terms of the, the first question, and, um, I mean, they're, they're naming everything you could think about. It's premises owners, it's suppliers and distributors, you know, uh, it, which could be anything from, you know, Home Depot to your local, you know, uh, home remodeling store. Uh, and then you're also naming all the manufacturers. I mean, there's pumps, valves, boilers, gaskets, furnaces, um, industrial products, suppliers, pretty much any, anybody you can think of has been named as a defendant in asbestos litigation. I think Mary Margaret may have given the number earlier. I mean, it's tens of thousands of companies and here in Georgia, it's, it's ever expanding. I mean, there's um, recent cases that have been fought against hospitals here in Georgia, for example, um, that have never been named in asbestos litigation. And um, and then in terms of trends, so you know, um, epidemiologically, they've studied the numbers of, of uh, asbestos disease, mesothelioma being the one that's most prominent. And um, so the, the trend line has has been predicted to be going down. It's kind of plateaued over the past several years. And so what we're seeing is that the asbestos litigation is still ongoing, kind of at, at current rates. I mean, I think filings have dropped over the past year with COVID. Which is kind of just something we've seen nationally across the um, across the litigation, um, but you know uh, predictions show that I mean the litigation is going to continue for you know through 2040, 2050. So it's a long time, right? Okay. Um, I would be curious to see some sample complaints if you can provide those to us. That would be helpful yeah. to just get a look at those and. On the hospital side, what what is the claim there that they had it in their walls and they were exposed to it or something or right yeah so it, it's a premises claim that they had contractors come on their site that were you know um, working with asbestos there that was you know being removed or manipulated at the premises. Okay. All right. Um, I'm happy. We'll be happy to provide the committee complaints, but just so you can see, this is one complaint, and you can see pages and pages of parties, of names parties. in the case. Um, it is, uh, you know, in the 50s uh, and trending upward in Georgia. The number of companies named um, named in the litigation. And are these usually in state court, federal court, both? Yeah, mostly in state court. I mean, occasionally you'll, you'll get a case in, in federal court, but I would say probably 95% of them are state court. Up until several years ago, the cases in federal court were all transferred to a MDL. That MDL has since closed, and now we are just starting to see new cases hit the federal court system. Okay. All right. Um, I'm almost done, this, Chairman, but this is really helpful for me to understand it. Um, Certainly. Take your time. Can you... Um, can you walk us through, just generally speaking, um, on the defense side in terms of the costs? I mean, I, I hear you in terms of that it's burdensome, and particularly if it's a company that truly had no nexus to the activity. But my sense is a lot of the pleadings are probably duplicative and don't require a lot of you know new work and attention. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but there, there's probably some that or for lack of a better term, fairly boilerplate in terms of um, answers, uh, et cetera. Um, and I'm just, I'm just wondering if it's possible, and it may not be, if you can provide some sense of typical defense costs, if they are. Like, are we talking usually $25,000 coming in the door, no matter what, $50,000 coming in the door, no matter what, and then settlement ranges too. Like, if you can... I'm defense counsel, I receive a complaint in, I get it, I talk to my client, my client says, we didn't have anything to do with this. This is just, you know, 
an overreach. They're naming everybody under the sun. This is cost of defense, nuisance value litigation. Get us out of it. Like, can you get them out of it pretty quickly in the, the proceeding? And if so, um, what's the cost? I just kind of like to have as much understanding of what so the companies are wrestling with as possible. Sure. Um, so it's interesting. So number one, I will say every plaintiff is different. Um, you have an individual plaintiff who has an injury, which includes a medical diagnosis, and every plaintiff has different exposures. We all have been lots of places in our life that would develop an asbestos exposure picture should we get sick. And you have to um, sort those out as you move through. And the problem comes in is that no individual asbestos case is looked at individually because there is a national landscape of asbestos litigation. So although you might resolve a case in Georgia for a nominal amount of money to get out of the case, what generally happens, I had a defendant in Washington State, they were sued in their first asbestos case three years ago. They made a nominal payment in that case, and three years later, they were named in 45 new asbestos cases within, you know, just that, and now are named in hundreds of cases around the country. So there is definitely a network of information that shares in the litigation, and the cost, although the pleadings are somewhat similar, mm -hmm. every case moves through different, whether it's a different plaintiff's attorney, a different judge. Um, all those things fit into your, I think the cases I looked at in Georgia, there were maybe 14 different counties that had seen cases. You have different judges, you have different processes. Um, and you can speak mm -hmm. directly probably to the everyday cost. Right. So like you're saying, I mean, so part of the 2007 reform was they had a venue provision. So before then, most cases were getting filed here in Atlanta, but now it's, you know, Catoosa County, uh, down in Savannah, everywhere else. And so you do see different complaints and different judges with how they want to handle things. Usually we have to get a, um, a you know, individual schedule in order for each case. And then, so that those are, you know, costs with just the answers and pleadings that can run in the thousands of dollars. And then in terms of the depositions, so you have... Uh, you know, a deposition that can last anywhere from one one day to, you know, three, five days. And so if you have somebody billing eight hours a day for five days, that can add up pretty quick. And that doesn't include prep, prep. time, you know, and follow-up costs. Okay. And then flipping to the other side of the equation, um, what types of injuries do those that are exposed have? like uh, if you've truly been mm -hmm. exposed to it like what does that do to a person i only know generally that it's a carcinogen but like is it yeah. debilitating and does it change their lives like walk us through and give us some context on that sort of it for you know valid claim that has exposure so there's a wide range um there's someone who could have asbestosis um asbestosis is um you know, on the scale of mesothelioma to asbestosis is kind of where we bookend. Um, and you might talk specifically mm -hmm. about some of the plaintiffs you've deposed and what they're. Right. So we see, yeah, like asbestosis. So that's, um, those cases were, were filed a long time ago. We now get maybe one or two, you know, every few years. It's a, it's not a, a cancer. It's non-malignant disease. It's scarring of the lungs that can impair someone's breathing, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not something unless it advances significantly that's going to, you know, uh, like significantly harm a person. The other issues we see are lung cancer, um, which, um, you know, is a cancer, um, depending on diagnosis and treatment, these things today, you know, it's, there's a wide range of options and, mm -hmm. and, and the outcomes for that. And the mesothelioma, which is usually caught pretty fairly late and um, has, I think, a life expectancy of somewhere like 12 to 18 months. Mm. And so that's, those are the main ones we see, um, you know, every now and then you'll see uh, some other type of cancer that, that gets thrown in, um, like, uh, but th those are pretty rare. I'm wondering, is it after somebody gets a diagnosis of mesothelioma, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, that then the lawsuits are usually filed? Right. Yeah. So they have, there's a discovery rule. So if you, just because you've been exposed, I mean, like Mary Margaret was saying earlier, you don't usually develop disease until 30, 40 years later. Yeah. So once they're diagnosed, then, then they have a couple of years to file their claim. And so 
uh, it's it's so well recognized now that these claims are, are usually getting filed pretty quickly after diagnosis. And I will add to that point. I think that's an important point for us. There are people out there who are very sick from yeah. asbestos exposure and finding ways to make sure the court system is not so clogged that they can't move a case through and also making sure that if a company does have liability for their injury, they have the time and money dedicated to that case for that person um, who has a legitimate claim. And that's what this bill is asking for. Just state the liability at the time you file the lawsuit in a sworn statement so we know that we're moving forward with the right parties in the lawsuit so that people who do have, um, do have an illness are put in a room with people asking them questions that they shouldn't even be in the room. Understood. Um, as an aside, less on the litigation side, but more from the public policy, public health side, is there anything that can be done in terms of screening to identify mm -hmm. that sooner? Mesothelioma? Yes. You know, I think the medicine out there is, we are seeing some advances. I've had plaintiffs who have had different procedures, but frankly, it's um, money that could be dedicated to research um, and um, you know, really on the medical side, as with any type of cancer, it's money and resources. We obviously know we have great doctors and great research abilities in our country with the right amount of money and resources out there that hopefully one day we'll see a cure. But on this, is there anything that can be done in terms of screening is more of what I'm asking, like, um, you know, with colonoscopies for colon cancer, like things like that. If you get screenings, your chance of identifying it and then helping sooner are much I greater. No, and I, I know, I mean, for, I know, for example, like with smokers, like a lot of times smokers have regular screenings uh, for lung cancer. I will say that making people aware that they could potentially develop the illness, in my opinion, has helped people identify earlier when they did start to have a symptom. This is something we should look at. Um, and so I've had plaintiffs in the past tell me, I went to a screening 15 years ago. They made me aware when I was working with such and such or when I was in the military that I had been exposed and that I potentially may develop this. And therefore, I kind of always knew um, people do have two disease litigation, which is a whole other. But a lot of times people develop asbestosis, live with it for years and years, know they have that, then may develop meso. And again, I think that identification probably gives just like it would any of us, just a heads up that this potentially could um, be a future risk for you. Okay, and last question is, on the bankruptcy side, are, um, are any companies doing a shell game where they're filing bankruptcy, but then immediately opening up a different company and stuff? Is that happening? I see that in different contexts of litigation. And so, I think the word that's been used in the past couple of months is the Texas, the, the filing where they you know, file one and do the other. I don't practice bankruptcy law. My side of it is general litigation and finding companies that are going into bankruptcy and assisting plaintiffs with obtaining uh, or assisting defendants with obtaining information about those claims. I don't, I don't have an answer for you on the reasoning for how a company structures. I will tell you 524G is a very unique process that allows companies to put their asbestos liabilities into um, bankruptcy. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very helpful. Thank you. All right, I don't see any more questions. Uh, so we are going to let y'all step back and uh, we have a few others that have signed up uh, to speak. And Representative Scoggins, you can stay right there if you're, okay. if you're comfortable. If there's anything else we can provide other than what's been requested, you can let Boyd know. We'll, be, we'll get you the complaints and the guard locks. Thank you. All right, and then it uh, looks like uh, Dan Snipes. Yes. Introduce myself to the committee. I'm Dan Snipes. I'm an attorney in Statesboro. I represent the Georgia Trial Lawyers Association. And thank the committee for their time this morning. Um, I think just generally there's a there's a handful of things that we want to say about this bill. And, and to start with from the fact that as the proponents acknowledged, there's a latency issue with the development of mesothelioma. Um, most of the people that our members represent are veterans. 
who have a combined exposure where they were exposed to asbestos when they're in the military and then they're exposed again in civilian life. And because of the latency time, because of the 30 to 40 years that it takes mesothelioma to develop, this person who's unknowingly exposed to asbestos when they're serving in the Navy, serving in the Army, serving as a Marine, they can't go back and say, this is the day I was exposed. When they're exposed as a civilian, they can't go back and say 30 years ago, this is the day I was exposed. So by necessity, the claimants in these cases have to name multiple people that were producing asbestos and putting it into the stream of commerce. It's not like a car wreck case where you can identify the driver who hit you. It's not like a product's liability case where you can identify the manufacturer of the product that was defective. It's a very different circumstance. Representative Holcomb asked a question about mesothelioma and what is this? And it is a cancer, but it's different in that it's not like I me, mean, you may think of a tumor that grows. What mesothelioma does in most cases, it attacks the lungs and the soft tissue that encompasses the lungs hardens and your lung is no longer able to expand and contract. And basically what mesothelioma does is it suffocates you. And what we got in this case is these are claims as they've acknowledged they've been around for a long time. And you have insurance companies that have by and large gone out and purchase the liability, knowingly purchase liability for these asbestos claims. And you have veterans who were unknowingly exposed to this. And you're being asked to put the interest of an insurance company that knowingly purchased these claims ahead of veterans who are unknowingly exposed. And from a public policy standpoint, that's not where this state needs to be. Now, we will have our members provide you complaints in Georgia. We will show you who they're naming and they'll explain to you how they're going about this process. But at the end of the day, what you're being asked to do is take a circumstance where it appears there was a fraud in North Carolina and to take a fraud that happened in North Carolina and punish Georgia veterans. And that's not where we need to be. There are some small companies that are involved in this, but I'm the state for Georgia. General Electric's not a small company. Union Carbide's not a small company. Honeywell's not a small company. These are people, when they come, this isn't mom and pop paying a lawyer by the hour. These are big national insurance companies and big multinational corporations. Last thing, we're going to get some data too about the number of cases in Georgia. I think from my understanding, there's about 10 cases a year being filed for the last five years. This is not a problem in Georgia. It's a very small thing. What you're being asked to do is to take a solution and find a problem for it, because there's not a problem that exists in Georgia for any of this. Well, we're going to continue to work with the committee. We're working with the proponents of the bills, but wanted to state in principle why Georgia trial lawyers is opposed to these two measures. I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we do have a question uh, from Representative Moptahan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just trying to get some information about uh, these claims. Uh, how many how many claims did you say was happening per year right now? I think the average is about 10 a year in Georgia. I probably think from me talking to my members, there's only been about four in the last year, four or five in Georgia in the last year. Okay. While you were giving your testimony, I was looking at the total asbestos consumption graph uh, over the last uh, 50 or so years. So it's like it peaked out at about 190 million tons were produced in 1976. By the time it was banned in 1989, 15 million tons were consumed that year. Uh, on a 30 year timeline from 1989, that would put you a couple of years ago. Uh, by its peak consumption, it's way past its prime, I'd say. You, you'd be on the end of that bell curve for these types of claims. In your opinion, would you say that these claims are kind of unfortunately resolving themselves because there's not a lot of exposure left, per se, unless you were in a building or location? 
that you know knowingly expose you to it uh, and didn't remedy the problem because of the prohibition against the McKinney manufacture of asbestos years ago, because of the incredibly high mortality rate of people who contract mesothelioma, um, the problem is working itself out because the people who had the most exposure are dead or dying. Right. Um, but there are, because you have remediation issues, you have circumstances where people are continually exposed to it as they go in and well, let's take the, the old judicial building across the street. Whenever the state decides what to do with that, that building was constructed at a time when it likely has some level of asbestos in the building. And there will have to be, you know, procedures put in place to remove that asbestos as part of whatever the state decides to do with that building. But there are, in that type of circumstances, there are people who are still occasionally unknowingly exposed. So the problem's not going to continually go away but just because of the lack of use going forward since it was prohibited and as we've gained more knowledge about the danger associated with it there are certainly fewer claims now than there had been 10 20 30 years ago final question if i may mr chairman uh, it's my understanding that uh, a person who was uh, you, you had mentioned veterans I often bring these claims. Talk to me about people who may have been involved in the attacks from the World Trade Center in that area. I know that there was asbestos in those buildings, and as they fell, tens of thousands, if not more, have been affected uh, by asbestos and its its effects on the lungs. And the people who were cleaning up and rescuing, you know, fellow Americans. Tell me about that. Well, I mean, I think, um, and I'm not an expert in that area, but I do know that for first responders, for firefighters, for a number of people who were involved at the cleanup of the World Trade Center and the attempts to try to, to, try to, to, to work for people down there, that there has been an enormously high incidence of lung problems. Of, of breathing problems. People have respiratory problems. I don't know the percentage of them that have been diagnosed with any specific claim, but I know that is one of the, the large problems that people who are on site immediately after 9-11, a number of them have developed problems and a number of them have passed away because of those problems. A number of these folks have moved to Georgia to live after uh, those attacks. Uh, will this limit their ability to make a claim? It would certainly place more hurdles on them to be able to make a claim. And it's one of the things because once someone's diagnosed with mesothelioma, they don't have a long period of time to make a claim to be heard in court because the, the they will die within 12 to 18 months of when they've been diagnosed with mesothelioma. So they have the lawyers who represent these people have to move quickly. And we've got to make a pop, 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 public policy choice of do we want to make sure they're looked after or do we want to make sure the people who have knowingly purchased these liabilities are looked after? No further question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Maltan. Representative Holcomb. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a couple of questions. With respect to the um, linked military service, um, do individuals that have been exposed have any claims against the federal government is there anything there in terms of recovery or is it just the private sector for their civilian lives post-service my understanding is these are private these are claims that are related to the uh, manufacturers of the asbestos product applicant whoever applied the, the products but i do my understanding is they do not have direct claims back against the military other than to the extent they get va benefits or what other benefits they may get okay so am i correct in interpreting what you said as they would sue whoever manufactured the products that they were exposed to while they were in the service? Yes. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Um, and then are there other classes of people that are exposed as well, or is this overwhelmingly veterans? Like, give me sort of the breakdown. Is it 80%, 90% are veterans, or are there other categories? And if so, what do those plaintiffs look like? Because of the latency. My understanding from my members who do this work is that most of their clients have a joint exposure. It is partially military, partially civilian, but the overwhelming majority of their clients 
are veterans. Okay. All right. I'd, I'd be interested in as much data as we can get on that. I don't know if there's a way to analyze maybe the, if it's a handful to 10 a year, it shouldn't take long in terms of data analytics to give us a sense of the proportion that are veterans. It's a relatively small group of lawyers in Georgia who do this work on behalf of injured persons. And uh, Ms. Zins is one of those persons who's here today. Uh, Rob Buck's another member um, who's watching digitally. He was going to be here today, but because of the nature of not voting today, we decided that we'll find out what the committee wanted and then provide that information to you. Okay, thanks. And then one last question. Let me just get to the, the big issue of what about this issue of asking for the um, the information about the trust claims? Is that an issue, or if 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 so, can you walk me through how? All right. So, and and I may at some point defer to Miss Zins on that specific question there. Mm -hmm. if, in fact, if I can, she signed up to speak, and I'd prefer just to defer to her because she knows more of the, the details of how that works. If that's all right with you, uh, Representative Hawk, and that gives us just a good transition. Uh, Ms. Uh, Zins, uh, thank you for being with us. If you'll just introduce yourself to the committee and then we'll let you get started with your testimony. Thank you so much for allowing me to be here. My name is Sharon Zins. Um, I am a lawyer with my own firm, Zins Law, here in Atlanta. And I've been uh, practicing in the asbestos litigation for about 16 years now. Um, the answer about bankruptcy trusts is that Georgia already requires us to provide during discovery any statements that our clients have made or signed uh, that involves exposure to asbestos. So if my client has made trust claims that involve uh, exposures, I have, I'm obligated uh, to turn those over. Um, there have been a lot made about fraud in that system. I am one of the lawyers who files most of the claims along with Mr. Buck for uh, asbestos victims here in Georgia. Um, I can assure you, I do not hide <laughs> those claims uh, during discovery. We are very forthcoming. The other information about claims that we are required to provide is uh, at the outset of the case, along with a complaint, we are required to provide a sworn information statement that lists all the claims we believe we can make on behalf of our client. Uh, and so we do that. Our, we identify the claims that we believe uh, that we can make, along with all the civil action defendants that we believe we can sue. Um, are there times that we file claims after the case? We might. Um, we are focused on bringing our clients justice during the time that they're alive, making sure they have a deposition in a timely fashion before they pass or before they are so incapacitated that they can no longer uh, testify. So um, this is not a question of a fraud on either system, but making sure that we are seeking justice for our clients in the most reasonable and efficient fashion. Representative Hulk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for that information. Uh, with respect to, and I'll be candid, I, I wasn't aware of the 12 to 18 month time period after diagnosis, which is extraordinarily concerning. Um, most cases that I deal with um, in the securities context, 12 months is the fastest, right? That you're moving things through and usually it's much longer. So here's my question. Um, is there anything existing to fast track these or is that something that should be considered um, if we're trying to do something for an individual before he or she passes, or is that not really practicable and it will just go to the estate? In other words, like get this in and you just move the timelines faster. Um, I'd like to explore that. Sure, uh, Representative Hogan, we, we would love to see that. Uh, there are other states like California that guarantees uh, the right to your day in court. So uh, once you are at issue, you are guaranteed if you meet certain criteria for a trial date within, um, I believe it's 90 to 120 days. I mean, those are kind of rocket dockets that I- That's fast. And it's very fast. And we're not suggesting that that be the case here. 
Um, we think that it, you know, everyone moves in a relatively fair fashion here. Um, Georgia courts right now, it is a, uh, up to the discretion of the judge. They are um, asked to make sure that a victim sees their day in court and to move expeditiously. Uh, sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. But in general, we believe that it's fair to do so. Um, contrary to what was stated before, it, there isn't any sort of asbestos docket that's clogging any one court right now. Um, during the creation of the Asbestos Act back in 2007, the venue provisions were added that removed an uh, asbestos docket from Fulton County. And now we have to go out to the courts in each county where our clients either live or where the exposures took place. So it's up to the judge in that county how fast the case is going to move. Uh, and you're right, very often we will start with a plaintiff who is living who will then um, uh, pass away and the estate will continue the claims and have them be wrongful death claims. Uh, unfortunately, I have it happen and just happened last month where I have a new client. I'm trying to gather the information and do my due diligence so as not to name uh, parties I shouldn't. Uh, and he passed away during that point. So now we're waiting for an estate to be open so that I can bring a claim on his behalf. Okay. So, since our judges at the trial level are generalists, do you think that they're even aware of what this <laughs> diagnosis means in terms of the time frame? Do you think it's widely known? Uh, no, we very often um, work in that first case management conference to educate judges about what's going on and why this is such a serious disease for our clients. Um, you know, this isn't someone, and, and I rarely bring an asbestotic case. Most of my clients are, are dying from mesothelioma. So we work hard to make sure our judge understands that if we don't move expeditiously, um, our clients will not ever get to see a jury. Mm, okay. All right, thank you. We kind of jumped into questions pretty quick with you there, Miss Sands. Did you have anything else you wanted to just generally share for the committee? Um, you know, I think that Mr. Snipes has, has handled most of those comments and I'd be happy to come back if there's additional questions that anyone has or to make a further statement. But in general, um, this is, as Mr. Snipes said, a problem, excuse me, a solution in search of a problem. We have a very small number of asbestos victims in the state of Georgia. Uh, Mr. Buck and myself represent most of them. And um, you know, we work very hard to make sure that they see their, see their day in court um, in, a, in a fair fashion to everybody uh, as, as we can make. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for being with us. It doesn't look like we have any other questions uh, for uh, each of y'all. So again, thank you for being here. Uh, and I don't have anyone else signed up to speak. So uh, what we'll do is I'll allow Representative Scoggins to kind of have the last word uh, as, as we are in a special session uh, right now. Um, the speakers ask us to conduct uh, you know, committee meetings so that we can begin the process of discussing complex issues. But of course, uh, without this being a topic address in the executive order, no action can be taken. Uh, outside of um, just that discussion. So I'm going to let Chairman, or excuse me, Representative Scoggins uh, have the last word. And, uh, and you know, with the understanding that uh, as a committee, we'll come back for further discussions and a potential markup of the legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the day. Uh, uh, we've got some work to do, and uh, we want to work to try to make these the two best bills that we can. Uh, the fact is that we're, we're not trying to deny anybody their claim on asbestos. That's not the intent of these two bills. If they have a, uh, if they have a claim, they need to collect for sure. Uh, the, these two bills, all they do is create transparency. And the other bill is to slow down the overnaming of claimants. That's what we're trying to do here. So um, thank you for the work. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, for everybody that testified. Uh, we'll be back. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Scoggins. I just want to thank the committee members who are, are here physically and those watching on Zoom. Appreciate your uh, your attention and your dedication to taking up this uh, complex issue today. If there's no other business coming before the committee, we'll stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>